So all of those do exist. Um, but this field really started consolidating more in the 1900s. Uh, before that, there were a few articles here and there about what a city feels like and uh, just how cities are formed, a few of them. But really, one of the earliest and most popular articles that came out was in 1965 uh, by this guy called Kingsley Davis. And what he did was uh, he basically consolidated all of this quantitative data from different parts of the world. And this had never been done before. So he consolidated all of this data uh, where he's marked down urban areas as places where population has exceeded one lakh. And he got the world population of these different countries, uh, put them down on a graph. And really, you can see from this graph already that the world population, which is the blue line over here, um, I don't know if you can follow my cursor, but the blue line, uh, which marks the world population, is much flatter as compared to the urban population, which you can see from the 1800s, is already rising at a much faster rate. Uh, so what Kingsley Davis said in his paper was that, hey, guys, like, look around. Um, the urban is actually becoming a more real thing that you're giving it credit for. And we need to deal with this, uh, this rising phenomena. Because if we do not, uh, there's, we're going to be in a mess because there's so many things that are going to happen that we would not have prepared for. Uh, so what he said was then that by 1990, around 50% of the human population is going to start living in urban areas. Uh, and that 50% is actually, it's taken as something that is, uh, like it's super valuable to urban study theorists because they think that after it reaches that 50% mark, like really you have to step up your game with urban studies. Otherwise, uh, you're losing out on a lot of sociological research and things that you will need to come up with. So I don't know if uh, you can raise hands or if you can unmute yourself, but I did want to ask a few of you if you can think about the kind of things that contributes to growth of urban population. So like number wise, if you think of your city as having 5 million people, can you think of ways in which uh, that population increases and you actually see this red graph go higher and higher? So is there a way that I can know who's wanting to say something? Yeah, I think if uh, folks who want to speak might want to just write in the chat bot uh, or yeah, just unmute yourself and speak up. So I know iPhone uh, has got an answer. Yeah, and someone from our team could also unmute Migrants coming, job opportunities, better infrastructure. Yeah, I think all of these things actually, uh, in a more like rudimentary sense, I think the migrants coming is something that does have a very strong effect. Uh, because if you think about this just in pure numbers, uh, it is the migrants who are coming in who are adding to the population number. Then the second thing that is a major contribution to urban growth is when people give birth in cities and the new people who are now staying in cities. So obviously the red graph is going to rise higher. Uh, and the third thing is when uh, cities, they start sprawling a bit. So you see these villages that are just surrounding the city and you can see this in Delhi. I don't know if most of you are from tier one, tier two cities, but if you are, this is a very striking phenomena there, right? where all of these villages start getting incorporated and you can already see the, the site or the level in which a city is expanding. So this really speaks to Kingsley Davis's problem <clears throat> where he says that, okay, cities really are becoming a big thing and we need to do something about them. So Davis did miss the mark by a bit. Um, he predicted that 50% of the population is going to start living in cities uh, in 1990, but in 2014, the UN, they published a report saying that we finally reached the mark where 50% of the world is living in urban places. And when I was going to college and like some of my first classes in urban studies, 
this was probably the most quoted report. Everyone was talking about it and like the professors too felt that this was something super important uh, because it is, it is what Davis had predicted and people were preparing for all of these years and now suddenly it's true. So uh, people started realizing that there are things that we have achieved in these last 50 years since that article came out first. Um, and there are still a lot of things that we are yet to achieve and places that we still have a lot of potential with urban studies uh, that hasn't been done. So people were freaking out. They were happy that this is there, uh, but it happened. And this is a graph that the UN put together and they've segregated it by the different continents. Uh, the urbanization rate up till 2014 is predicted with this blue line. Uh, and then you can see their future prediction. Sorry, the uh, actual urbanization rate in 2014 is this blue line. And that's the number there. So maybe in your chat box, or if you want to unmute yourself, uh, maybe you can tell me what stands out from this graph, like things that pop out to you or you notice. So I can't, I can't see any of your faces. Um, right now I'm just staring at my screen waiting for some chats to come up. No? Okay, so one of the things that is pretty obvious is uh, you can see that Africa and Asia, they have a much or a later start. It's not steeper, uh, it's not flatter, but it's a much later start. And you can actually in fact see that it is a steeper growing curve, which means that these countries or these uh, continents right now are on a, okay, iPhone did say that more in Asia and Africa are rural. Is my voice lagging by the way? If it is, you can message in the chat. Uh, but yeah, they are more rural or they were more rural and this is understandable because a lot of where urban studies started was in European countries and a little bit now it's shifted entirely to the United States. Um, and these countries have been leading all of these earlier theories that were coming up. So they really base their entire theory of rapid urbanization, that urbanization is becoming a big problem that we need to deal with based on what they could see around them. Um, and given that industrialization or the industrial revolution actually hit Asia and Africa on a later time, uh, which might explain some of why the curve started later for them. And you can also start to see that after a while, of course it starts plateauing because there's only that much percentage of people who can live in urban areas. Um, and yeah, you do need rural areas still to provide you whatever sustenance you need with agriculture, but there's an increasing trend. And I think Malaysia, if I'm not wrong, is uh, the country that has the highest urbanization rate and it's something around 82, 83%, I think. Um, so it's really interesting to use that as a perspective as well to figure out what's happening in your own country and just see how the employment opportunities, like someone said in the chat, Ahan Dangi said in the chat, um, how they shift around when such rates are at such a staggering rate, uh, the organization's increasing. So now that we get a sense of why cities are important, uh, maybe it's also useful to answer what exactly urban studies is. And if any of you have a guess for what that might be. You can just start to think about things that you like about your city and you would not want to move to a rural area where you miss out on that. Um, that's a great way to start thinking about topics that you're interested in within urban studies. Okay, I think there might be a lag, so I'll just give you what definition I have and then read out any answers that come up. Okay, urban design 
Yashi sir's urban design. Definitely a big part and it's actually a very up and coming uh, subsection of urban studies that just focuses on design and heritage. Uh, and super interesting because right now, I don't know if you're aware of the um, Black Lives Matter movement. A lot of people have been talking about it. And one of the issues that came up is that people are uh, taking down the statues that were put up in different parts of the cities of slave owners, of uh, people who are celebrated but are actually war criminals. And right now, a large part of urban design is trying to figure out what to do with those statues and how do you preserve that history, but at the same time, um, not give in to things that will have racist impacts. Development of cities in terms of infrastructure, for sure. Facilities, entertainment. Entertainment is actually also a very interesting one. Um, also because, at least in the urban studies that I got to explore, uh, there wasn't as much talk or no one there had specialization in entertainment and it's a field that I found out about much, like much later on. Uh, but there's a lot to do with that too. Um, and I think one of the interesting papers that came out in 2014, there was this guy called uh, Neil Brenner. And he basically said that uh, the way that you've been talking, the way that everyone has been talking about urbanization and what urban studies is, is actually very limited. It's a very narrow view of it uh, because he claimed this theory of planetary urbanization, which said that urban or urban spaces have reached such a pivotal point that it impacts absolutely everything. Uh, so you can think about rural markets, you can think about how the panchayat system is set up there. And according to Neil Brenner's theory of planetary urbanization, it is going to affect just about everything. So you can't delineate urban studies as Kingsley Davis was trying to do, where it's only places that have population over one lakh. And I guess like that poses a lot of problems for urban studies because then you're just left with the question of what is urban studies? You don't have a proper answer for it because he's saying that everything's urban studies, uh, which is a problem that a lot of disciplines face with uh, and urban studies has it too. Okay, so I actually did want to talk a little bit about uh, the reading that I gave you. Uh, can people who've done the reading just say yes in the chat box so I know how much I am to speak and how much I can ask for answers? Okay, maybe there's a lag again, so I'll start us off. Um, the reason I assigned this particular reading, it's by Abdul Malik Simon, um, who's an urban theorist. I think he's teaching at Sheffield right now in the UK. Um, and he's actually a very celebrated urban theorist who uh, people talk about a lot, at least in my college and the other urbanists that I've met outside. Uh, he's widely quoted and some of his work is very useful in understanding how cities function, even if they don't give us direct answers for what policies we can implement. Um, and the reason I assigned this particular reading is because I think it's mostly just like long prose of Simon trying to describe this one city, Kinshasa in Congo. And you just start seeing the variety that urban studies can bring with it because it covers Okay, I won't get into what it covers. Hopefully you will help me answer that. Um, but yeah, it does show that the city actually has so many numerous aspects that we don't always think about as being very important or crucial to a city. Uh, okay, I haven't gotten any yeses, so I'll just, I'll give you whatever I got out of the reading. So one of the things that the reading was trying to do um, and the chapter or the 20 page uh, excerpt that I've attached was mostly trying to answer the question of, it's a very dramatic question, but what can urban residents do with each other? Uh, and it's trying to answer that question through this one city in Kinshasa. And it's saying how uh, 
So Kinshasa is a very poor uh, city and doesn't have enough municipal funding. So a lot of the key infrastructure, so like all of you have mentioned, infrastructure is being very important to urban studies. Um, so all of these infrastructure like pipelines and drainage, uh, roads even, buses, public transport, all of those things are very limited. And it was interesting in the reading to see that uh, like the colonial heritage of Congo is passing on to how the city is dealing with all of these infrastructural shortages today. So if you can have a look at it later, there are a couple of maps in the reading. And one of the maps shows how like this part that's super close to the river is very well planned. It has lots of green spaces, all of that. Um, and it was actually used by the Europeans at that time. And all the, um, all the natives, they were sent to the peripheries and they were asked to live outside. And the conditions on the outside, because the colonial project was a lot about just guzzling in funds, guzzling out funds uh, from these colonies, they didn't have as much money or infrastructure. And a lot of this still continues today. And what the reading is showing that because of that like historic and now it's continued lack of infrastructure, uh, a lot of these people, like they don't have access to uh, water pipes. So they, they have to interact with each other and they have to form some kind of connections. Like they talk to the person, the water tanker driver, they give him some money as a monthly rent and say, hey, can you just like unload a week's worth of water to me? And don't tell anyone about this because I'll get in trouble and you'll get in trouble. Uh, but I'll pay you good money for this. And oftentimes it's also a higher amount that they have to pay, higher than a normal pipeline would have costed. Uh, so all of that is encapsulated in this reading where uh, basically Simone is arguing that residents have to think uh, like very creatively to come up with these solutions to the lack of infrastructure. And he uses the... Uh, or like the theory of people as infrastructure, he coins it. Uh, and he says that when there is no such facilities provided to you, people really have to step in and figure out ways of dealing with things uh, that otherwise are not provided by the state or the local government. And it was really interesting to come across this idea because while reading it, I started to realize what he's really talking about is Jugaad, which all of us are familiar with. Like there are parts of our lives which aren't governed by the government um, and we have to or we choose to come up with ways of like just making things work for us so that we get the best outcome or things happen the fastest possible. Um, so yeah, Simone was really just talking about Jugar then uh, and what he does in this reading is then try to define city life. Uh, which he talks about in the way of people having these interesting engagements with each other that they otherwise would not have had. Um, and that is not to say that the lack of infrastructure is a good thing and we need to romanticize it or any of that. Uh, but it is more of that this lack of infrastructure or the lack of government control in certain aspects of your life is providing you an opportunity to do things. Uh, and again, the government also can come in with certain interventions that help people interact with each other. Uh, but that's not covered in the excerpt, so we don't go into it. Yeah, is there any questions or anything that you want to talk about related to this concept? I think if you have the time, you can just skim through the reading. Um, it's not a super theoretical or boring one or just read the parts which is describing Kinshasa, just to get a sense of the ways in which people can write about the city and think about the city. Okay. I'll just move on to the next slide then. So this is a artist, Mauro is an artist that I met in Sao Paulo in Brazil. Uh, and he did this very interesting thing. So most of his time, he would spend just walking around Sao Paulo, finding different empty walls. And if you can see this yellow little house on the left-hand corner, he just goes around painting that house in different places. Um, and sometimes he writes this nice quote with it, this tagline that says, Vera Sidachi. Um, it's very similar to the English veracity. 
and it means the truth or being completely honest. Uh, and I got an opportunity to meet Mauro and see some of his work and see him do some of his work. So super interesting because he was describing how he came up with this tagline. And in Portuguese, actually, the term Vera Sidache can be broken up into two parts as well. Uh, into Vera, which means to see, and Sidache, which is city. So basically what he was doing through these murals or even the smaller spray paints that he has everywhere, uh, which you can actually see at this link over here on Instagram. Uh, what he was trying to do is just get people to look at their city and deal with their city in a more honest way. Because his claim was that if you actually want to engage with the city, you have to look around and find things that you otherwise would not have noticed. Um, because if you don't do that, there are people who are suffering because of it, or there are things that are crucial to understanding how a city works that you will definitely miss out. So he just goes around painting Vera Sadache everywhere. So I wanted to take you through a case study that I got to do in Singapore. Um, so my college, Yale and US, it's established in Singapore. Um, and basically, I think my professor at that time had heard some version of the Vera Sadache theory. And she asked all of us, all, us, all her students, to just go out into the city and find an urban space that we find interesting and just write an ethnographic paper on it. Um, and this was very early on in Singapore, in my time in Singapore. Um, and I just heard about the migrant workers who come in like large, large chunks to, from Bangladesh, from India, from China and Philippines. Um, and they work there for a few years before they move on to a new place. So I found that very interesting. And I decided to use the ethnography for that. Um, and I thought maybe it's going to be an interesting case study for you guys as well to just get a sense of how you can get this principle of Vera Siddhacha, if you want to implement it, like how is it possible? Um, so yeah, I went to this temple in this little uh, space called Little India in Singapore where it's a bit on the nose, but a lot of Indians and Bangladeshis congregated during the weekends. Um, and they would just get their weekly chores done. They would go to this temple. They would hang around for a bit. Uh, and this temple actually got a lot of migrant workers during Sundays. So I went there and uh, just very soon because I was there with the purpose of doing an assignment, I got into a conversation with one of the migrant workers who had come from Tamil Nadu. Um, so we started talking and he mentioned how he had moved around from Tamil Nadu to Saudi Arabia and now he'd come to Singapore. Um, and what like, got him to move to these different places and like a lot of you have said that job opportunities and uh, I think someone said, Okay, yeah, job opportunities uh, is a major pull towards these cities. So even in the international realm, like people are pulled out of their countries so that they can go towards these higher paying jobs. And through some of our conversation, we actually uh, found out or I found out that he got a salary of something around $1,000 a month, uh, which in Indian terms is a decent salary, right? It converts to, I think, 50,000 uh, rupees per month. But in Singapore terms, it's hardly enough to survive and to have a decent standard of living. Um, so during this entire conversation, we moved from this temple, we walked around some of the streets, and we eventually even got to the place that he lives in with some of his friends and co-workers. Um, and what we found out there was that a lot of uh, the money that they get as salary, they actually just send back home uh, so that the people who are like their families, their uh, wives and parents, whoever's receiving the money can actually convert it to Indian rupees and get the benefits of having lower uh, living costs in India. Whereas they in Singapore survive on whatever minimum amount they can. But this also means that their living standard is very low. Um, so that was something that this, or like this push that my professor gave us to go and explore a urban space uh, allowed me to find out. Um, and I started telling my friend about this entire paper and the experience that I had with these bunch of migrant workers who'd come from Tamil Nadu and uh, West Bengal. Um, and we got super interested in the topic because it wasn't something that we thought would be super prevalent in a place that is as 
globalized as, as well as like it's treated as a place where uh, I don't know everyone can come and earn lots of money and it has all of that capital. Uh, so we took on this project where we went onto the government website, Singapore's government website. Um, and we got the locations of all these migrant worker dormitories, which you can see in the red dots uh, all across here. Um, so the bigger dots are uh, dormitories that had more migrant workers. So we just got all of this data on migrant worker dormitories and their uh, population and also Singaporean population. And uh, we put it down on a map. And the interesting thing in Singapore is that the migrant workers, uh, they can't, they don't have access to the rental market or uh, they don't have access to purchase uh, property in Singapore. They can only stay in uh, government designed and government uh, like dedicated migrant uh, dorms. So they could only stay in these red dots that you can see. And what we found out there is like there is a statistical calculation that you can do with this about how segregated are migrant workers from rest of the population. And we got a really, really, really high statistic which said that, so it's called a dissimilarity index. We don't need to get into the specifics of what that is or how it's calculated. Um, but we found that 90, like the dissimilarity index was 95%, which is amazingly high. And you can already get a sense of some of that just looking at this map. Like you can look at um, the bottom left corner and you can see how the Singaporean population, the citizen population there is the lowest that it can be. It's the lightest shade of green. And the migrant worker dormitories are most concentrated in that area. Uh, in fact, it's also interesting that like some of these areas that don't have data, they're marked as no data over here. Um, they have migrant worker dormitories despite being uh, catchment areas. So they're basically wildlife areas where construction isn't allowed uh, to normal developers. And migrant worker dormitories have come up there. And once you start visiting some of these dormitories, you even see that like, they're completely cordoned off to the rest of the city. They're fenced away or they're really inside canopies. So you can't interact with them. You can't see with them as much. Um, which if we try to link back to Simon's theory where he says that the way that urban residents interact with each other is really what is producing the city. That is something that the government there was intentionally trying to quell. Um, so you can start to feel or get a sense of uh, why interaction is important or at least like the amount of importance that is placed on interaction. So this is another map that we did and it's for public transit. This one is for public buses. Um, and we found with this data that an average Singaporean resident has access to twice as many buses as uh, an average migrant worker living in Singapore. And this number is even more drastic. I think uh, an average Singaporean citizen we found from our data has access to two metro stations uh, in a one kilometer radius around them. Whereas an average migrant worker has access to only 0 0.5. So in some cases, some of these dormitories have access to zero metro stations and some of them have access to one or maybe two best case scenario uh, metro stations. So you can already start to see that these migrant workers are really segregated uh, from a lot of the Singaporean population. And it starts to, like it really does beg the question of why is this happening? Uh, why does the Singaporean government need to do this? And there's a lot of articles that are written about this uh, that we can check out. Uh, but yeah, with this case study, I just wanted to show that, okay, if you start finding out more about your city and if you start um, I'm sure a lot of you already do that. Uh, but yeah, if you keep a lookout, there's lots of things that you otherwise would not have assumed to be a super big issue or um, very relevant that come up if you just uh, step outside and interact with people. Do people have any questions or want me to repeat anything at this point? Super interesting. It is super interesting. Um, yeah, we can talk more about this if you actually want to know about it.
um, send me a message or mail and yeah, we can, we can see what to do. Okay, so I've spoken about the migrant worker issue, but I think, um, okay. I think a migrant worker could actually explain this better. And what's interesting in Singapore is that a lot of these migrant workers are starting to get aware about the ways in which they're oppressed in these places or the difficulties that they face as migrants in Singapore. Um, and what's really nice is that they've started this movement where a lot of them have begun writing poetry and essays and articles and they form like groups out there you aren't allowed to unionize, uh, but they form like support groups and things of that sort uh, to help them out with this issue. And one of the particular characteristics of the migrant workers in Singapore is that they love poetry. So the poetry movement there is really coming up very strong. And it's, it's super interesting to see because uh, you can see from the maps that the interactions that people get to have with each other are very limited. But with poetry, you can transmit your message to the rest of the population that otherwise would not have known about the things that you have to deal with through so the population who actually wants to know about it for sure. But still, the message gets out there and gets out there internationally as well. Um, so I'm just going to play one of the poetry that a worker has written there. Or oh, to figure out the audio, right? Should be fine. It, I mean, once you play the audio, we okay. should be able to hear it. Okay. Rising, rising five stars. Yep, it's audible. Rising, rising okay. five stars. Rising, rising five stars. Rising over the stormy sea. Five stars. Rising, rising five stars. Ami Morkan. Ami Dual Shade. Bangladesh take Singapore Ashi, Amar Kazakh construction. Ami Bangladeshu, and this paper I'm giving you to take care of me. I'm like a person, person of the Dinere Por Din, Strong Borone, a Shahore, put it is Tori, Tori, Amar. Baba, 
তোমার ভালোবাসার সমস্ত সত্তা আমি ভুলতে শিখেছি বাবা আমি বেশ বড় হয়ে গেলাম যখন আমি এগুলি ভাবি আমার পেন হয় সেটা একটা হলো আমার এই জীবন যাচ্ছে দেশে এটি পাচ্ছি আমি অর্থ প্রতি রাতের মতো আমি হয়ে মধ্য রাতের নিশাচর আমি কেবল প্রবাসী শ্রমিকই নই একটি পরিবারের ল্যাম্প পোস্ট আলোচনা তো ঘর অন্ধকার অর্থ সার একটি ফ্যামিলি অন্ধকার অর্থের মাধ্যমে একটি ফ্যামিলি আলোকিত হয় মাইগ্রেন ওয়াটার মিনিং একটি ল্যাম্প পোস্ট একটি লাইট আলো Over the stormy sea, five stars are rising, rising, five stars are rising, rising, five stars are rising. Over the stormy sea, five stars are rising, rising, five stars are rising, yeah, whoa, 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 Okay. So I think that poem actually describes all of what I've been trying to say um, or trying to understand and study a lot more beautifully. And there's a lot of such poetry going around in Singapore if you want to understand the migrant worker issue. Um, that, yeah, it's just really beautifully done. But what's really cool is that it's not just poetry that's being done in Singapore um, to address this problem. There's a lot more that's happening. And this page just begins to list down some of the groups that have come up. And it's interesting to see the different kinds of things that you can do to respond to an urban issue or a social issue that you notice. Um, because it can, it can expand to advocacy, education, research. Um, you can write stories about it. You can publish in the newspaper. That's, yeah, it's endless. Uh, and actually, some of these uh, movies, they're all movies, yeah. The first three are movies. Uh, some of these are just beautifully done. And the last one, the Migrant Writers of Singapore is actually a coalition that's come up, uh, a coalition of migrant workers who just like writing and getting the word out. Uh, so I think with this, I'm trying to give a sense of the expanse that is possible, basically. Uh, Okay, now back to urban studies a bit. Uh, these are some suggestions that I think are really interesting and they might be a good entry into urban studies. Uh, so City Lights is a Bollywood movie. I think it has Rajkumar Rao in it. Um, and it's about a migrant who moves from rural India uh, and goes to a city to find employment there and how he eventually resorts to things that you would not have imagined he would resort to. Gentified is a Netflix series um, and it's really interesting because it talks about like it's entirely focused on this idea of gentrification. For those of you who don't know it, gentrification is um, the process by which like a neighborhood or like a designated area, uh, the rent prices start to hike up because uh, people start viewing that area as like mostly it's viewed in the context of Okay, it's becoming an artsy area, it's a bohemian area and people want to move in there. But it can be any range of things that pushes up rent prices and the original uh, inhabitants of that area have to start moving out to make way for these new people to come in. Um, and gentrification deals with what happens to those people who have to move out and what happens to their attachment to that place and whatever community that they had created there. Um, I was actually recently thinking about this in context of Oroville uh, which we can again have a discussion about later, but that also has some tendency of this, right? Where um, like you have created the space where a lot of people from all over the world are attracted and the concept of it, of having a space where people are more uh, communally focused is really good. 
but what happens to the people who used to live there and now they're just in surrounding villages. Um, so Gentified is again a great, uh, it's a great series. The Monocle on uh, uh, Monocle Urbanist on Spotify, it's a podcast that I'm listening to right now. Um, it has these small snippets of stories from different parts of the world. Most of the times it's uh, global north countries, richer countries, um, but sometimes they, like a lot of their stories are interesting, I think. Then Planet Zen, it's the go-to place for uh, anything that's light and urban studies related. So you can look for absolutely anything. You can look for films related to urban studies. You can look for books. Uh, you'll find it all there. It's a great place to intro yourself into urban studies. Um, and the last one is the meme page that I showed you earlier. And there's a bunch of Instagram pages as well. Um, and they're all like map related. So like every day uh, the admin will post a map, say like the different housing structures in different parts of India or rural India. And then you can start seeing how those housing structures like interact with the character of that particular state or the city that's close to it. Um, so it's super interesting. I can give you the links for that. Uh, later. So yeah, that's it. Okay, great, Mehul. I think uh, when you sort of plugged in Auroville, just wanted to add that uh, I've had experience living there. So I spent okay. a whole year experimenting with the idea of volunteering. And there was a time when we also had 12 students, Ed Brand students join me for a two week program in the summer. Uh, obviously, intentional communities are uh, purposed to, you know, create that utopian sort of setting. But what you said was uh, interesting that, you know, they also displaced local populations and it sort of uh, doesn't really have that right intention. And it's hard to sustain such communities eventually. Uh, so great, I think it was a fantastic conversation. What we also wanted to segue into was a uh, second part of the discussion and uh, where, how do you actually come up with projects like this? Like what is it that really prompted you? Of course, you've explained a little bit of that in your journey. And what kind of support did you get from faculty and administration at Yale and US? I think with how you get started with the project, it's mostly like, I think anything can be made a project of. So if you are really interested in cafes in a city, uh, you can find out about, or you can map, like create a map actually of the different cafes and rent prices around those cafes or if you're interested in, or you'd really like narrow lanes. Um, so some cities, they have more of these uh, central road networks and others, um, they have more of these winding lanes that were created long, long ago. So you can always start like, uh, like just walking down those lanes and try to collect data. And I know that uh, Arjun, you have uh, this special module created just for uh, research methodologies and data collection and all of that. So it might be really good to check that out as well if you have time. Um, but yeah, after you have like this toolkit of methodologies, I think what really helps me at least get into a project is figuring out why I'm doing it and what I'm interested in. Because otherwise there's just a whole expanse of things that you can study. Um, as for faculty, uh, they have been brilliant with support and I'm sure you'll get this uh, in whichever university or college that you go to, uh, they're great to bounce off ideas with. And not just faculty, I think your friends are also great to bounce off ideas with just to find that connection that you have with a particular topic. Because you can feel it, like if you're super interested in cafes and studying them, you will feel that um, passion towards it when you're discussing it with a friend. So great to bounce off ideas with faculty, definitely discuss your research methodologies. Um, because with these research projects, which are, or like these topics that we are taking in, in urban studies, they can be so wide and so, uh, cross discipline. Like it is important to figure out what methodology is going to work, uh, well for that particular topic. So maybe the mapping works for the cafes or someone had mentioned, uh, development and infrastructure. Maybe the mapping helps with that, or maybe you actually go and have, um, like interviews, like semi-structured interviews or, or open flow conversations with people and try to get their ideas of how they get their water. And you can start to see some of like what Simon was saying. Uh, 
with respect to how people deal with infrastructure and getting this infrastructure in places where it's not as easily accessible. So I think that's the second part. And there is a third part, um, which I think you don't necessarily need to get into right now. You can think about this when you're doing a research project with the intention of publishing it somewhere, but have some sort of theoretical base, which your faculty, again, will be great at pointing you towards. Um, I know I can point you towards some urban uh, urban studies or mostly urban studies and environmental uh, research uh, repositories and things that you can check out for whatever project you're interested in. Uh, but your faculty would be great at that too, because they can tell you what you or like what what are the bigger theories that you need to incorporate into your project, and then work with that. Yeah, so I'm sure a lot of the audience members are also looking at Asian schools and uh, Yale and US is gaining more popularity. And of course, uh, we'd want you to uh, share a little bit about your experience at Yale and US. How was it like? And uh, did it really, uh, uh, you know, when you were thinking of enrolling and paying your deposit, did you have some idea of what it was going to be for you? And how did it actually pan out? Right. So I know I mentioned this in the podcast that we did earlier, um, but I hadn't planned on urban studies at all. Just academically speaking, I hadn't planned on urban studies at all. Um, I, in fact, didn't know what it was. And I think the experience of Yale and US really helped me get into it because it's a smaller college and it is much more focused on interactions. Uh, we're talking about interactions a lot, uh, but it's much more focused on interactions uh, so there was this random day that I was having lunch and a professor joined me um, and she started talking about her research work and was in urban studies. And she was actually researching uh, water politics in Delhi and Bombay. Uh, so she would go into slums and figure out like this exact thing, right? How do people actually uh, get water there? And there was an interesting take in her project where I think Delhi had a water crisis sometime in 2015 or 16. Um, but yeah, Delhi had a water crisis at some point and she was basically in her project trying to figure out like how does that water crisis highlight all of these lack of infrastructure across the city, which otherwise would not have been highlighted because now everyone's talking about water and everyone's talking about water shortage and how they have to deal with it. So how do these voices that earlier um, had to deal with it on a normal basis get amplified? So anyway, uh, this professor was talking about her research. I was super interested. And next thing, I'm an urban studies major. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there are so many things that are going on around the world today. And our students are also coming up with very creative solutions. The launch of Ordle. We have a humanities club, which is being launched. There's a debate society. And something that we're working on is uh, a format called Middle Ground, uh, where it's not a very competitive setup, but it's more about listening and understanding viewpoints through Socratic dialogue. Mm. So we'd love to engage you further in these one-on-one -on -one sessions and uh, presentations. So uh, some of you who are in the audience have questions regarding your projects. I'm going to unmute everyone. I know it's going to be uh, a bit noisy, but yeah, we'll, we'll figure out how to, uh, how to listen to uh, all of you here. <laughs> so I'm asking you all to unmute and speak up if you have questions. What did you like about the presentation? What are the thoughts going forward? What are ideas you are working on? What do you see limiting you to sort of complete those? Happy to answer. Mehul and I can hopefully add our two bits here. Yeah, go ahead. So even if you don't have questions, I think it would be interesting for me and people who haven't heard of your idea just to get some ideas and discussions floating around. I'll give you a, a sort of a, a idea that I came up with. I'm at my office and we are at uh, Gurgaon and I stay right across the street so I can easily get to work. Uh, and we are in a commercial building which has many cafes and restaurants. 
every week I see one or two shutting down and, uh, and I know the owners because I've been here for six years and it's uh, some of these conversations have, have led me to think of artifacts. You know, when you're a historian, uh, you look at a historic moment like we are living in, it's almost like World War or whatever. And there are artifacts which are not necessarily objects, which say uh, in the true sense, it could be even these conversations that we are having uh, mm. can be interesting and watching certain trends and what people are saying. It could be restaurant owners and certain common feelings that they are going through or something unique someone said. Uh, if it's documented well, that's also a project. As, as simple as that. Or even something, sometimes I wonder, you know, they just leave so many interesting things about their cafe and uh, they just leave with whatever they can take and it's shut. And I wonder the mural with beetles on a wall at Big Wong in Gurgaon or, you know, something else at a Nayab Handi in Crosspoint. So it's really uh, uh, fascinating to take an object which they have discarded completely, write a little piece about it, even personify that object. And there you go, you have a very interesting project and you can encourage other people to do that too. For sure. And I think archives is becoming a big thing, especially with this lockdown. Um, the, I've seen so many archives come up across places where people want to capture stories of how, uh, how marriage is being dealt with during this or how funerals are being dealt with. Um, and I think the same concept can be applied to cafes and to people who have to vacate their uh, rental uh, spaces. And yeah, you're right. There's so much that you can do with small objects too. Yeah, so in order to sort of uh, help students who attended uh, take this forward, I'd be happy to, if you know me already, of course, you know how to reach us, uh, but I'm going to write my email ID in this chat box anyways. And I know there are other team members here. Yashi is a great resource. Shamali is also here. It would be great to, for us to hear from you, your ideas, and any way we can help. Uh, We'd be happy to do that. Mehul, yeah, if you want to leave your email ID behind too, I think here, it'll be great. Okay. I was saying, since we have some time, uh -huh. it might be nice to just hear about, even if you don't have projects that are, oh, I sent it to you privately, sorry. Even if you don't have projects that you've already thought of or already started implementing, it would still be nice to just hear ideas of things that you're interested in or something that you thought of implementing earlier but couldn't really get around to doing yet. So if anyone wants to talk a bit. Yeah, so I'm going to actually uh, <laughs> point out to a few people because uh, Nehal, I'm really curious to know you. Uh, if you can unmute yourself and I know you're really keen on art and design and we've just started working together. So uh, in a way, I'd want to brainstorm uh, on this forum and see what kind of art design projects you've worked on so far. Um, well, okay, so then one of my main art design projects that I've worked on, um, it was about two years ago. It was, um, the topic was architecture and um, I, Many people, their designs were most like uh, mostly like um, taking a bunch of different architectures and compiling them together to create like a new structure. But what I did was I wanted to show like Indian culture, so um, I used the Indian uh, the Taj Mahal and I included um, a bunch of collages and pictures of like Indian achievements or the culture itself and put them inside the Taj Mahal so it just showed the culture. Um, and later on, I enhanced on that by um, by um, like putting that in the, uh, the Taj Mahal structure in like a shape of an eye, and surrounding that would be um, what's like newspaper articles, old newspaper articles of like independence of India, and um, like when the when India first went to the moon, or stuff like that. And it my entire art project my theme is based on india because there's just so much to explore and see so yeah those are some of my artworks that's great and just to give context to everyone else uh, she goes to school in china 
and she's been locked out of the yeah. country right now. <laughs> so you don't know when you'd get back. Um, so great, we'll definitely have a conversation about the perceptions of uh, India, Indian culture in China. Uh, that'll be uh, yeah. so interesting, especially now with uh, the border skirmishes. Um, so yes, whoever, I think I don't know uh, Namya, so I don't know if you'd like to share something or I don't know Pranavi. Uh, so yeah, feel free to answer Anya again. Uh, yeah, I'd love to hear you. Yeah, again, it doesn't have to be a super developed idea, I think. Um, I think just saying it out there makes it a bit more real, even if you're just thinking about it internally. Okay, in case uh, if you have questions about uh, the process of mentoring students on projects that you could do, which are impact focused, but also have a research angle to it. And if you have specific questions, again, you can write to us, but this is a great forum. We still have a few minutes for, for discussion, so feel free. Are you working on something or if you need a framework on doing something, we can definitely answer those questions too. All right, so I think with that, we could uh, wrap up a little sooner. Uh, we are also going to share that uh, reading Mehul had requested me to send off. And uh, we have email IDs of all participants, so you'd get something in your email. I'd also want you to explore one of our uh, new online sort of platform where we've uh, put up these interviews with our students and you can obviously go to our podcast website, but there's also a video section where uh, you can listen to students who graduated with different majors, be it art design, sociology, philosophy, software engineering, computer science, or other STEM fields. So here's the link, take a look. And if you have comments, uh, yeah, you can feel free to add those as well. So thank you so much, Mehul. It was great just chatting with you as usual. And I look forward to uh, helping you connect with more of our students one-to-one -one and taking this forward. Yeah, that'd be super exciting. I look forward to whatever ideas I hear. All right, good evening, everyone. They have a good, uh, a good few days ahead and hopefully uh, uh, a better virtual school experience uh, in some ways. I know it's been really hard for everyone. Um, and I'm also quite tired of looking at the screen and organizing webinars and joining webinars, but it's always a delight to meet new people through this forum. So there's always a plus and a minus to our virtual lives now. So take care. See you soon.